So the idea from the session uh, came from my training portal. So this is a personal project that I have. Uh, currently, there are uh, 40,000 users. It's not a lot compared to a product. But uh, given since this is a personal project, um, I'm pretty happy with the numbers. And this was built using um, everything from uh, Google Platform. So it's Angular, Angular Material, and also running Firebase, also using Cloud Functions, and all the goodies that we, we can use from the Google Platform. Um, so the agenda for today is I want to share with you a few tips how to build the UI, make it responsive, um, use serverless. So serverless is something that is uh, it's a buzzword, so everyone's talking about it, so we need to include here as well. Uh, Real-time database, Firestore, there are a few, still a few questions about this. Authentication, cloud functions, and of course, after developing, we need to put it in production, so build and uh, deployment. Uh, my name is Loiani, I'm from Brazil, so I'm a developer and business analyst by day, and by night I do some blogging and YouTube stuff in Portuguese, in case you want to learn Portuguese. Um, these are my contacts as well, in case you want to get in touch. And let's get started. So first things first, uh, building the UI. Um, today we have several different options in the market. We have Angular, Vue, uh, React, and some other frameworks, maybe another one was just created by now. Um, so I decided to go with Angular. Uh, Angular is a framework, my favorite framework right now, and has a very large community, so you get really nice support. Um, there's also modularized components. This helps us to organize the project better. Uh, there's also the CLI tool that helps us to create a project, um, some bootstrap code as well, along helping us to build a project and um, split the code bundle as well. And only by doing that, just splitting the code bundle for production, we get a little bit of more performance. So there are a lot of good things in Angular. So to set up Angular, I'm gonna go through real quick, real quick here. First things first, install Angular CLI. So the CLI is a command line tool. For that, we need NPM. Um, and to install NPM, we need Node, Node.js as well. So basically, this whole stack was built on top of Node.js. So you do NPM install Angular CLI, and you'll have the tool available for you to use. After that, you can go to your terminal and just type ng new and the name of your project. And since version 6, you get a really nice uh, wizard, so kind of a step-by-step. -step. Would you like routing? Would you like to use CSS, uh, SCSS, less styles? Um, and so on. With this, we, we create a project, and of course, after the project is created, we wanna create modules to organize our application, we wanna create components, services for our business logic, um, we can create pipes, classes, interfaces, whatever our heart desires, and Angular CLI will help us with that with the Angular schematics. So as you can see, ng, g, module, service, uh, pipe, class, interface, and we just give it a name, we can also inform the path, and then Angular will create this nice structure for you. Well, if you're not a big fan of the CLI, you can also use uh, support from the tools. I really like using VS Code, there is also support for WebStorm, but in VS Code you can install an extension called Angular Schematics, and you get all of this right-clicking. So if you wanna spend time uh, typing, right-click, choose, and voila, it's done. So with this, we can create all our code. But this is all about, Angular is all about the structure, the architecture of our client application. Uh, we still need some UI components. Well, I don't know about you, but I am a terrible designer. Um, so for this reason, I need to use things that are ready for me to use. And Angular Material is good about because of this. We get cross-platform components, and we also get modern UI components. And when it comes to forms, for example, all those validations that we have to add, uh, we have a really good integration here. And of course, we also have components for layouts, such as card, panels, uh, accordions, um, alerts for pop-ups, uh, we get toast, um, what else? Uh, we also get toolbar, the side nav bar, everything that we need for an application. So we're really good with it. And of course, 
as um, Michael mentioned, there are a lot of components from the community as well that you can add if it's not provided here. But then we have, okay, we have the structure, we have the UI components, but it's 2019. We're not gonna start a project and this project needs to be responsive. So we need to add something to, for the responsiveness as well. Uh, you can do the CSS by hand, it's your choice, but in case of Angular, we also have a library called Angular Flex Layout, and this is gonna provide directives and also a special API, and we can use our XJS with observables to listen to the, uh, the screen when we change, when we resize the screen, so we can listen to those changes and also apply changes to our, um, our HTML. And of course, we also get directives uh, to listen to if, if the user is accessing from a phone, from a tablet, from a desktop, um, and whatnot. So just as one example, so for the course detail page of this particular application, I wanted to do something similar to Udemy, where you have the course detail and then you have the list of the modules and within each module you have the list of the lessons. And of course, I want to show to the students how many lessons they have in each module and also the duration of each class and how much time they will need to complete each of the modules. So we have three uh, places highlighted here and this is from the desktop, so I can see all of these details. So going to the source code, here we have a few directives from the Angular Flex layout, uh, but just by applying FX hide, so I, w I don't wanna hide because this is uh, false, the first one. I don't wanna hide in case if it's a median to a big screen. So I will show how many lessons there are in the module. In the second case, there are the duration. So I don't wanna show the module duration if it is a big, uh, small screen. And the third one is the same thing. I don't wanna show the duration if in case it is also a small screen because I won't have enough room for that. <laughs> so going to a tablet, it's kind of like a mid-size screen. I won't see the, how, how many lessons there are in the modules just because of that. So I didn't have to touch any CSS just applying those directives, I get all of that. And you can have uh, responsive menus just by doing that as well. So it's kind of easier to work this way and it's very, uh, pretty integrated with Angular. Okay, so now we, we've done the UI part. Of course, UI without any data, we need, we need data as well, we need to consume data as well. So Surfly is something that is pretty in right now and um, there are a few things to think about. Uh, um, for example, we don't have to think about servers. It's serverless after all. Of course, there are servers, but we don't have to worry about that. Um, we don't have to worry about uh, load balancers and all that stuff. We can scale as needed. You only pay for what you use, so you don't have to get a, a very expensive hosting and only use half of the resources that you, that you need, so only pay for what you use. It is always stateless, but there is only uh, one con, that's my personal point of view, is the vendor lock-in. So if you decide to go with one vendor, it's gonna be very specific for that vendor. If you need to migrate, you have to put some effort into it during the migration. <laughs> so for this case, since we're talking about a Google stack, decided to go with the Google Cloud Platform, Angular on the client side, and in this case I chose Firebase. So Firebase has a lot of different services. So the application running the browser with Angular can have all the authentication from Firebase, access the database from Firebase, and if I need any additional logic, I can just write my functions, kind of like a microservices, and I get all the additional logic that I need from that. So speaking of Firebase, when we talk about Firebase, people only think about the, the real-time database, that, that's what it's known for, but it's much more than that. When we go to the Firebase page, we'll see all the services available to us. However, if we take a look how they market this, this is more for mobile applications. For this particular case, I'm working with a web application, but there are still 
some of the services that I can use. The, all the other ones are more focused on iOS and Android, but all these other ones that are highlighted, I can still use for my web application. <laughs> okay, let's do that, let's set up Firebase. So we go to the Firebase console, you get a welcome page, you uh, click on add new project, <coughs> you give it a name, can give it an ID, just sell your soul, checking all those boxes right there, and create a project whenever we do things anyway. And then it's time. Do we choose between the real-time database or the cloud Firestore? The Firestore is currently in beta, so it's not production ready, although I'm, I like to use beta things in production, <laughs> that's why I chose to go with Firestore. But there is slightly a difference uh, for the real-time database, as the name already says, it's real-time. So all the clients will be connected to the source, and <clears throat> in case we have any changes in the data, all the clients will get that update. Something similar will happen with the Firestore as well. However, searching data in the real-time database is not as easy. So the Firestore now has some capabilities that will make easier uh, for us to do that. So you create a database, <coughs> then you get this window, which are the rules. We'll get to the rules in a second. You can start in the locking mode, meaning you won't be able to write or, re um, write or read anything unless you change the rules, or it's a party. Anyone can read, write, doesn't need to be um, logged in or anything. So for development, we'll start with that. <coughs> We're gonna Store collection. And then we're gonna create some properties. This is a NoSQL database, so we're gonna work with documents here. And then we get something like this. There is one big difference here between the Firestore and the real-time, <coughs> is that the real-time database, we can import and export JSON. Now, if you go to GitHub, you will see a lot of different scripts that you can use for Firestore, but this is a lifesaver. Hopefully, in the future, they will also add this functionality to the Firestore as well. Then, we need to add Firebase to our application. Uh, you just click on the bottom, you'll get this pop-up, you get your configuration, and you also get the CDN file, but <coughs> Since we're working with Angular, we don't need to add the CDN directly. We can, of course, npm install another library. Um, and there's also different libraries for different frameworks as well that we can use. In this case, there is one that is called the Angular Fire or Angular Fire 2, as it was known. Um, npm install in the project, and we can work with our XJS observables. If you are scaling your application, and need to use state management such as NGX, uh, NGRX, this library also has support for that, so it, it is really great. And we can work with the real-time database, uh, the Firestore, and also with authentication. So, okay, we're gonna get that configuration, we need to add that to our Angular project. And then we, there are different ways we can do this. One way that I recommend doing that is going to environment.ts, which is kind of the environment uh, file that we have in Angular, <coughs> and then you add your configuration. But one detail here, in Angular we usually have two files, you can create more if you have more than one environment, maybe a QA environment. So for development, we're gonna use the environment.ts for production, we're gonna use the .prod.ts, so ideally, we're gonna have two Firebase projects, one for development, so we can mess it up, and one for production. So we can add the configuration for both. We're gonna use locally the development one, and when we do the production build with Angular, we're gonna use the production one, and we don't have to touch our code, comment, when we check out, you know, those, all those extra steps. Everything will be ready for us here. Then, we initialize Firebase in Angular just by passing the Firebase configuration into the Angular Fire module. 
Another thing that I also like to use is because we're using Firebase throughout the application and we have different modules and then we have to import everything all over again. I also like to create one module and do all the exports here and then I only have to import one module in all my other modules. And here I'm gonna add everything from Firebase that I need to use. The Firestore, real-time database, cloud storage, authentication, I mean, whatever I need to use, I'll import it here. <clears throat> so with the setup in place, we need to start building our API. <clears throat> One thing that is good about Firebase is that we don't need any middleware, we don't need a backend to go to the database, the backend will go to the database, we'll get the data, we can manipulate the data, and then send it to the front end. In this case, our client will be able to access the, the database directly from the, the Firebase uh, SDK. So that's why we can have a serverless application. Um, and to access, is, it is really easy. You have a collection. You can also search this um, reference uh, where. So this is one of the, the things that are different from the real time to Firestore. And uh, we can also get a particular document if, or, if we already know the ID from that document as well. And of course, uh, following best practices, since we are working with our XJS and observables, we can also um, call our, um, assign the RxJS call to the database to a local observable and then use the async pipe in the template. This means that Angular will automatically subscribe to the observable, will consume all the data, and when this component is destroyed, it is going to automatically unsubscribe from the observable as well. <coughs> and what this means is we're going to avoid memory leaks with observables in our application. And we can also update and create data as well. So it's really easy, as you can see, just add a new object to a collection, update, we can also overwrite and use the set method, and we can also delete a particular object from Firebase as well. Now we have all our data, but we need to put some order to it. Um, <clears throat> we want our users to authenticate in order to access a few of some particular documents or not. So for authentication, we also have authentication uh, in Firebase, we have different providers we can use, <laughs> usually email, password, and um, the Google one. And all the other ones, you have to authorize in Facebook, Twitter, or GitHub, so it's pretty easy to set, set it up as well. But one thing called my attention is that there are some advanced features as well. One is this one at the bottom, the quota. Usually when we have a website, there are a lot of bots on the internet that will try to create users, they just try to hack your application. <coughs> and here, we can manage how many users will be able to create new logins or authenticate from the same IP. So we kind of have some security from Firebase re regarding this as well. And one thing that is really important is that when we go with the project to production, we can remove the local host because it's production. We don't want anyone from local host access production unless you're gonna satisfy your desire of debugging production. But it's production, don't recommend doing that. Um, and of course, for authentication, using the SDK for Angular Fire, we can also easily um, do all the authentication. So we can sign in to Google or GitHub or Twitter or Facebook, just calling a method and um, the, the platform will take care for you for everything. We'll show you the pop-up, we'll do the linkage, we'll authorize and it will return you, uh, redirect you here again. Get current user and sign out as well. So everything is available for us here. And of course, with authentication in Angular, we can use the route guards and check if the user is logged in, I'm not gonna let the user to go to a particular route, a particular page, without the user is logged in. So we kind of, we can have some security here as well. <clears throat> um, you can use your imagination and you can create your signing and your login, uh, signing, sign up pages. Um, but if you don't wanna have 
the if I want to spend time on this, you can also use libraries for that. There is the Firebase UI web where you get everything that is done for you. Just npm install, add to your project, and you're done. Um, next, we have Cloud Functions. So <clears throat> with Firebase, we're gonna we're gonna access the database directly from the client. Uh, but sometimes we want we want to do a few other things that are not available for us in the client. Uh, we want to do some additional logic, manipulate the data a little bit more. For that, we can use the cloud functions. So for cloud functions, <coughs> we first need to, <coughs> excuse me, we first need to install in our project. Then we run Firebase in it. We're gonna select all the services we wanna use in that project and just go through the wizard. And there we go, we have it installed. So for the functions, we get a functions folder here. And we also get all this um, package.json script. And this means with cloud functions, if we can npm install, we can use it. So this is really great. Um, <clears throat> we can choose between JavaScript or TypeScript. If you like TypeScript, you can write the functions in TypeScript as well. And there are a few different things that we can do. For example, we can do HTTP requests to functions like a microservices. And um, we can also trigger Firestore real-time database and also send um, for authentication as well. We can trigger authentication and do something there as well. And of course, John Papa presented a session about debugging, but in this case, we love console logs, and we can access the console logs here as well on the functions. Um, it's kind of a little bit um, tricky to debug in this way, so in this case, go with console log. And uh, another thing is about the rules. So when, when we start, everyone will be able to read and write data. So you wanna write the rules. Do the user needs to be authenticated? Does the user need to have a special role to access that particular collection or document? So we can add everything right here. <coughs> and this is just write code, try it, see if it works. If not, rinse, repeat. Um, so we can, we can uh, do this from the console, or if you enjoy using your favorite editor. You can do that from VS Code as well. But there is one thing about the syntax highlighting. You can install an extension for that that will help you. Um, and it, it just avoids a lot of error just having the syntax highlighted for that. And of course, after that, you can deploy uh, your rules using the Firebase console as well. A few tips uh, that I've learned along the way is especially with, Fire, with Firestore, is that we're gonna pay for the request, how many times we go to the database to write data and to read data. So when it comes to Angular, we can write functions directly in the template as well, but we need to be a little bit careful with here because uh, do ang the way that Angular works with the change detection, whenever ev anything changes in the HTML, it's gonna trigger the change detection, and it's gonna go again to the database, and we don't wanna do that. So one way to go around that is writing pipes. Pipes by nature are pure, meaning that they're only gonna be, uh, this code is only gonna be executed when the data changes. So with this, we can avoid unnecessary requests to the database. So that, that will be tip number one. The second tip is, I've changed the data modeling at least three times in the project. So I had an idea, created some dumb data in, in Firebase, started writing my code, and I, mm, it's not working, because everything is RxJS, it's observables. Don't get me wrong, I'm the crazy reactive lady, I love reactive programming, but sometimes things can get a little bit complicated when you have uh, different sources of code. Um, so in this case, you have to try what, what works for you. You're going to model all your data in, um, in your NoSQL database in Firebase. 
that works best for your for application. How am, gonna, am I going to retrieve data from the server, from the database, that I don't have to manipulate a lot? I'll get the data exactly as I need. So just try it out and uh, see what, it wor what works and what not doesn't work. Um, and then you'll get to your perfect modeling that at least works for your application. Um, and at last, uh, after we developed the application, we did everything, of course, we need to put it in production. Otherwise, just it works on my machine. Um, so hosting and DevOps, we can use different services, Travis CI, SQL CI, um, Jenkins, uh, Azure DevOps. Um, I like to use Travis. So for Travis, for example, you just need to generate a token. Uh, you're going to log in and you're going to get this token. You're go, going to go back to your, um, to your CI environment. You will add a token and then you're going to write your script. <laughs> so a couple of things here. Uh, one is whenever I do a pull request, I don't want to trigger the build. I only want to trigger the build when I go, when I <clears throat> commit to the master branch, because otherwise you're gonna commit code and it's gonna trigger, you don't want a code going to production without running all the testing, someone reviewing the code, you know the drill. So just be careful with this uh, before you uh, deploy to production. <clears throat> and then you can deploy the hosting, the rules, the functions, whatever you are using in this project. And of course, <clears throat> We also get custom domain. It takes a couple of hours to set this up. You're gonna have to change the DNS, and then, well, just wait for the DNS to make the changes, and, and uh, it's gonna be done. And one thing that is good, you're gonna save a few bucks, because <clears throat> Firebase already provides the, the, the SSL uh, for us by default. Once you, um, once you link your custom domain, it's gonna take a couple of hours as well until it, it kicks in. And then we have a project in production, up and running, using Angular, uh, Material, Firebase, Functions, and everything we can use, all the, the goodies. Well, that's it. That was a little bit of my experience. Thank you so much for your time. And I also have a few resource links here in case you are interested in learning more about any of these technologies. Thank you.